Welcome back everyone to this third section already of our Global Knowledge Exchange. And this section is all about you and your reflections and questions about what more we can do. And let's begin with some of the questions and reflections that have been written into the question box. And we are very happy because to help us through the details, we are joined by Emily Reynolds, who has been keeping her eye on comments and questions in the chat box. So, Emily, I know you're in the exhibition center, so I'm super curious to hear from you. Are there any reflections from your side on what has been posted so far? Hello, everyone, and um, thank you so much for everyone who's been sending through comments from the start of the event. Um, there's been some really inspiring, engaging ones that have come through. Um, I think possibly the sort of the key theme that has come out to me has been one around the importance of being connected um, and the importance of connections needed around break, for breaking barriers, for creating new content, contacts, and just to, and, and the connections needed to build on the, the amazing momentum <clears throat> already happening globally. Um, so I've picked up a, out a few comments that I'll share. Um, so one, is, one, one question was around um, yeah, how we break barriers and approach challenges. And, um, and this was sort of quite, it was quite general, but it was around how do we implement climate culture in a country where people do not care so much about the environment? And I think this could be applicable to schools as well, universities, workplaces. Um, and it was one of the earliest ones that, have, that came through. <clears throat> and I would hope that some of, the, um, so, so, some of the young people addressing some of these, as we've heard, <clears throat> might have helped to um, inspire and um, engage with this and, and, and give ideas um, around young people being the, the drivers, the grassroots movements, the calling on leaders joining together and also working together with a sort of targeted passion. Um, but of course, you know, systems change it remains a huge challenge and so much work is needed. Um, there was a really interesting, challenging question from the Sudan Hub around governance and inclusion. <clears throat> And how can environmental governance support in managing environmental crisis by considering community participation at the heart of it? So um, <clears throat> really fascinating, important question there to consider. Um, a, a couple of practical questions around, um, around universities and climate change, like who, how, how can young people in universities in the UK get involved? Um, who can they, who, who, how, how can they be involved in, in working groups and who to contact? Also, yeah, a question from a comment from uh, someone in, in Egypt. How can, when can we see green universities across Egypt, and how how can this happen? Um, there's quite generally a few que questions and comments around the green scholars. How can young people be involved, and how can organisations work with the green scholars? Um, so Augusta from Augusta Otoba from the Philippines. Um, as a request from her um, to be, part, how, how, you know, how to be part of the Green Scholars. It would be great to have representatives in the Philippines to give people a young voice there and um, for their voices to be heard. And Linda Rose, um, there, there was a comment around possibly working more with um, Green Scholars in the future. You know, are there, would there be plans for the British Council to work more closely with Green Scholars around climate, climate awareness and our climate programmes? So, um, more generally, there was also uh, just a, a comment around the importance for the inspiring presenters that we've heard today um, at the event, um, to be talked about more and promoted more and given further platforms to the ones we've, see, we've just seen, and uh, to build on, on the connections that, that are happening already um, to, to address the really important, the really, really important issues of today. That's it from me. Um, back to the studio. Thank you, thank you, Emily, so much. And if I can just say, I don't know if you can see it with the lighting, but you made us blush. Oh, up in your wow, mind. yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> but indeed, thank you so much for those reflections. And it's great to, to hear all the enthusiasm and the, the excitement and interest, especially from people to hear more about this. Uh, next, I'm also happy to say that we are also joined by Christopher Graham, an English language academic researcher and teacher who has been instrumental in much of the research mentioned today. So, Christopher, I just want to start off by asking you, how have you found today? And, and could you tell us what your reflections are? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, well, it's, it's been a really rewarding day, and I've learned a lot of things I didn't know about uh, parallel projects, the ones that I've been involved with. Um, I suppose, really, I mean, I'm a, 
I'm an optimist with anxiety, I would say. And the work that I've been doing with the British Council, I found some amazing projects around the world, uh, educational projects, climate change education projects in Sudan, in Morocco, in Cuba, all around the world. And that, that, that makes me very optimistic about the future. I must say, and it's great to see so many other fantastic projects occurring around the world. But if I had a and anxiety, and I said I'm an optimist with anxiety, it would be how we can transfer these grassroots projects, amazing grassroots projects that I've seen, to get them into national policies, to get the dialogue, as someone said earlier, between practitioners and policy makers. And there are so many structural and other problems and concerns around that. Um, and that's where my anxiety kicks in. But, but today's actually made me feel very positive and very optimistic about, about the range of initiatives. Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you so much for sharing those reflections. And it touches upon, I mean, what has been said at the, at the start by, by Emily Wright in the reflections. Connecting is a big part of it. And how do we bring everything together uh, moving from here? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we also have uh, other reflections. The next reflection coming from Matt from the WWF, who is joining us as well. And Matt, given what you've heard, where do you think that we should focus our energies next? Well, for a start, it has, as all the speakers have said in, in turn, it really has been an inspiring uh, selection of presentations today. Um, and the main thing that struck me is just how much thinking that was really rare and very, very progressive only a few years ago seems to, to, to you know, really be embedding um, lots of people sort of saying things that really chime with uh, our strategy at WWF, um, looking to how to maximize the power of education um, to tackle the issues we face. Um, and a couple of things really chimed. I mean, Alison Tickle's uh, uh, presentation, especially, I was I had my video off, but uh, it's probably lucky I did because I would have uh, been very distracting in how much I was nodding along there. That idea of um, bringing culture uh, to the to the forefront and to the centre of this um, debate and, and to action on climate in education, I think, is absolutely key, and and that's something which um, I've talked about quite a lot. And, and I think um, it comes uh, round to the point that um, a lot of the things um, that we talk about when we talk about the climate crisis are, no matter how big they are, no matter how um, all-encompassing uh, and existential the challenges might feel, they are sort of short-term results of a, of a short-term issue. Um, it's, it's very urgent, it needs to be dealt with, but there's an underpinning uh, issue, which is um, an understanding of uh, sustainability and, and of feeling that connection with the natural balance um, of our planet. Um, and I think that's what sometimes gets forgotten now, because there's this urgency uh, and this sense of, of momentum around uh, addressing the climate crisis and reaching net zero. And I think um, we do ourselves and our students a disservice if we focus on that kind of bubbling surface, um, even if it does have uh, interesting learnings and it has some um, some really important outcomes that we can strive for with schools around, you know, particular green skills, particular uh, future proof um, skill sets and values that we need young people to have. And obviously an understanding of the climate crisis because it's part of the world um, and education needs to reflect reality. But I think where education can really come in is underpinning um, young people's decisions now and in the future with this understanding of sustainability and that systems thinking that leads to really being able to apply it. Um, and that means that what teachers can engage with now and in the future will be the same. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a universal that idea of sustainability. And I think that makes the whole thing less scary for students, um, for young people who are scared about the climate crisis, because actually it's proactive, but also it's thinking about applying these skills to create a better future rather than just trying to solve problems in the here and now uh, and avert disaster. And I think it's more encouraging for educators as well uh, because it's something which we can get to grips with now, which there's a huge amount of thought already available from the UN um, ESD, Education for Sustainable Development curriculums and things like that. That actually we can just feel that we we can build a, a skill set in ourselves um, and a way of bringing this into our schools and to our students um, that is not something we have to rethink every year because climate science develops further um, whereas i think when we're thinking about climate crisis climate action in schools we're worried it's an ever moving um uh, situation there's ever more complicated science coming out there's uh, social justice issues um, involved in there, which you're, you, you know, you feel like you're treading on eggshells. And I think that's what a lot of uh, teachers might feel 
a little bit nervous about. So I think education and sustainability should be um, two sides of the same coin. So that, that sort of felt like it was uh, a little element of, of what so many people today have been have been talking about in terms of what's worked, um, not least that importance of hope in everything that we do with young people around these issues. Um, and we've had some fantastic projects uh, around COP26, um, as well as engaging schools all around the world, more than 30 countries are known to take part, uh, more than 38,000 educators um, access uh, the resources we were providing. Um, and a lot of it was exploring the roots of the climate crisis because it was about COP26, which is obviously seeking to address climate change. The, 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 what you, because I, I think you said that so eloquently that, you know, it's, it's not on the surface, right, we are focusing on these targets and there is an urgency, but as, as you said, it's so crucial that we understand, you know, the, the re really at the core of this all, it's really about our relation to nature and how we fundamentally see it and teach, you know, um, you know the, the next generation, future generations about that. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that with us, Matt. Uh, I really want to thank you for that. Uh, and I'm also really pleased to go on to our next colleagues uh, and friends in Sudan who have been watching and listening to today's exchange. Uh, so welcome to you, and I'm really curious to hear your reflections as well. Uh, my name is Watan Mohammed. Uh, I'm a young climate activist, and I would like to talk on behalf of Sudan Hub. Uh, firstly, we would like to thank the British Council and the Climate Connection for giving us this incredible global exposure to see other climate activists from all over the world uh, making action, actions to um, tackle climate change. Uh, we got many ideas, creative ideas that we can implement here locally. Um, in Sudan here, in Sudan Hub, we are participating from different disciplines as young people. We are making um, positive impact. We got uh, the chance to make recommendation in the last COP in Glasgow. Uh, some of us could have made it there and could have participated in the different uh, discussions and negotiation and came back here to make the local uh, impact. And um, we would like more to um, engage more to make a uh, recommendation to take it to COP27. Thank you so much for sharing those insights and, and you know, all these perspectives and indeed how we move forward to COP27. Uh, so thank you so much there from Sudan. And, and now we'll hear from Anoum Ahmed from the Cabinet's office. I am at the Cabinet office part of the COP26 UK presidency and I really feel like I've been on a journey with the British Council um, from Alok Sharma sort of speaking at the launch event of the Climate Connection Programme to being here today where we're disseminating the findings uh, and what's been achieved and I think it's been so fantastic being here and actually seeing the full breadth of all of the meaningful initiatives that the British Council has been able to put on from the Green Scholars uh, to the Creative Competition. Um, it's really showing how you, we can empower young people to take their ideas into concrete action. One of the things that I was really struck by, in fact, was um, the, the case study of, of the young creative competition students from Botswana who were able to design an urban green space uh, in their city. Um, so I think that just really demonstrates that when you uh, give young people the kind of the tools and the incentives to be able to transform their ideas, they can really uh, achieve something really big. And I think I just want to touch on the fact that the Global Youth Letter had a real impact at COP26, and I want to really address this to all of the young people who were part of that campaign and who are probably listening today to say that the ideas and the reflections that uh, were part of that letter contributed towards the Global Youth Statement that was presented on Youth and Public Empowerment Day as part of Youngo's uh, headline event uh, at COP26 uh, in front of Alok Sharma, Patricia Espinosa, who is the UNFCCC Executive Secretary, as well as other ministers and negotiators. So I just wanted to conclude by saying that um, the work of the British Council has been a fantastic contribution to empowering young people, and I'm really keen to kind of continue working with them um, as we begin to deliver the Glasgow Climate Pact this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anam, so much. Thank you for sharing those insights and indeed also like how we move forward from, uh, from here and, and bringing everything together that has been said. So thank you for that. And uh, I can now also see uh, Pablo Roseo indeed on, on this side next to me. Pablo, it's good to see you. Uh, Hi, good to see everyone. Thank you for being here. Pablo, I'm also curious to hear from you what your reflections are after hearing everything today. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you for this journey and thank you um, everyone for such an amazing program, colleagues, partners and participants alike. I've got the enormous responsibility of incarnating and representing the Americas, which, as you know, is the region's, the, the world's most biodiverse region, around 70% of biodiversity um, in the world is found in the Americas and um, about six or seven countries um, from the region are, are in the top 10 uh, list of most biodiverse countries in the world, starting with Brazil. Of course, um, it's also a region, and this has been well documented in, in the media in the, past, in the past years. It's a region that has been experiencing alarming increases in the frequency and in the severity of uh, weather extremes um, from the tropical storms in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean um, to the um, terrible uh, fires in the Amazon, the droughts in North America, um, and, and yeah, the overall increases in, in temperature and in, in, in sea, um, in, in the levels of the sea. No? I was based in, in Buenos Aires until recently in the Argentinian capital. And on my last day, I was there four years, my last day coincided with the first day of spring, the first day of the Argentinian spring in October. The temperature that day was 40 degrees, um, which is, is, is apocalyptic. Um, I think the, the thing that most struck me from, from everything that I've heard today was uh, came from the Global Youth Letter and, and the fact that 67% of respondents thought that the challenge, the enormous challenge of climate change um, was something that was bigger than that um, which uh, polit the political leadership of, of, of countries can cope with. And I think, um, I think that's, um, I, I agree with that, but I think that's precisely a confirmation of the, the relevance of this offer, which works with education and, and culture sectors. Um, and, and I started thinking around, well, what are the challenges in the Americas that this program, this offer has contributed, has shown, um, potential for 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 further impact and i think um i think there are two big things in in this region one is the need to educate um this is despite the the responsibility that the region has the americas has in terms of biodiversity and the very clear um uh, effects of climate of climate change in across the different countries there are countries in this region where up to a third of the of the population still deny the reality of the climate emergency. So the need to work um, in education is essential, and language education is, of course, um, a very important vector, a very imp important vehicle of this. And we have um, very successful stories in this, particularly in Colombia, where we have a program um, that works in English language teaching with the Ministry of Education that. Um, that has developed developed as part of the program a series of climate change themed um, uh, episodes that reached over six million you now in a country of, of of around 50 million total population the second thing that for me um, is urgent um, in in the america's context is the need to um, educate but also to make sure that the discourse um, is, is inclusive of the various uh, diverse voices, in particular those that are mo most affected by the climate um, uh, uh, change situation. Um, indigenous uh, communities in the Americas represent around 10% of the total population, 6% in North America, around 11% uh, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. But according to the FAO, um, indigenous populations are, are um, guardians of up to 80% of the, glo the, the, the world's uh, biodiversity. And these communities, because of their remote locations, because they're semi-isolated, are, are rarely part of, um, of uh, official discourses, media discourses, too, um, around, around the situation. So um, th these are the communities that are most affected. They're, they're not only because of the change in, in climate conditions, but also because their lands are constantly being uh, occupied by, by um, legal and illegal uh, economic sectors. In, in the Amazon, for example, illegal mining is, um, is an enormous problem, naturally, 
and socially has devastating consequences. And um, in, in terms of the experience of climate connection in the Americas, it's been through the arts that we've managed to um, very eff effectively work with um, future, uh, future leaders of these communities, right. empowering them, giving them access to leadership skills and communication skills, but also developing new spaces, new networks for them to meet and effectively represent their concerns. Right, because like 80% of what, that's, that's quite, I mean, I just want to re-emphasize that number. That's, that's, that's crazy when you think about it. 80% of biodiversity being protected by those indigenous communities as well. Uh, Pablo, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that with us. And actually, as you were speaking, and also when the other people were speaking and doing their reflections, I saw some vigorous nodding here on my <laughs> left side, Mano. Uh, maybe just jumping over to you, do you have any reflections on the reflections that I we know, were provided it's with? It's just so powerful to hear about what everyone's saying. But what I would uh, maybe go back to um, some of those reflections from Emily and you know, I think all of us here today, all of us watching, um, you know, believe that there is a climate emergency. But for those people who still don't believe that, what what do we need to do? So awareness raising, you know, sharing the videos, um, the exhibition is actually also going to be accessible by a virtual tour just to get that message out there and to inspire people. Um, and, you know, there are lots of opportunities to get involved. Um, so, yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. And I see that Alison has also joined us. Uh, Alison, maybe just briefly, uh, any reflections from your side on what has been shared just now? Yeah, um, I'd agree. I would agree with Mono. I think it's just really important that we keep going. Um, although the climate connection is changing over the coming few months, um, we're still committed as an organisation to making sure that climate informs everything that we do. We're also looking at our own uh, organisational net zero strategy. More on that soon. Um, and we have some uh, key announcements to make, I think, around our commitments moving forward. So perhaps I can start off with a couple of those. Uh, and then I know we have colleagues in Egypt um, also waiting in the wings to tell us about their plans around COP27. Um, but particularly our English work that we heard um, about so well from Hala and Colm earlier today. So through that work, I think we've reached around 100,000 teachers around the world through the, the podcast, the MOOCs, the lesson plans. So our commitment is to invest in making sure that we can reach 500,000 teachers um, over the next three years and to provide them with opportunities to integrate climate and sustainability themes into their English language teaching um, moving forwards. Um, we're also making sure... Alison, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'm so sorry to oh, interrupt sorry. you. Uh, That's okay. I mean, these are these are super interesting insights. I think we were planning to do them uh, after we uh, uh, watch oh, the okay. video message that we have, but that's totally fine. Do keep the, the energy and spirit in here, uh, because in the meantime, I just want to thank you both, by the way, for the for you know reflecting on everything that has been shared. So uh, thank you so much, and our sincere apologies for not being able to get around to asking more questions and getting to all of you for your thoughts. I know the team would welcome your thoughts and the contact details can be found online on the British Council's Climate Connection website uh, if you want to contact them uh, to pick uh, some questions or comments up. And next, we are delighted now to be able to hear from Alok Sharma, the president of COP26, uh, who sent us this encouraging message for today's event. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to join you. All over the world, young people are driving climate action, calling for change, developing solutions, and holding their governments to account. And I've met many, many inspiring young people on my visits across the world. I visited well over 30 countries last year, and I've spoken to young people in civil society everywhere that I've gone, from Italy to Nepal, from Bolivia to Ethiopia. And everywhere, I've been struck by the same passion, commitment, and focus from young people. And programs like Climate Connection have played a vital role in mobilizing action across borders, reaching over 230 million people across 178 countries. The youth movement that is sweeping the globe played a vital role in creating the conditions for significant progress at COP26 in Glasgow last November. The Glasgow Climate Pact, agreed by almost 200 countries, is historic. It keeps alive the ambition of limiting the average rise in global temperature to 1.5 degrees centigrade. It contains ambitious text on finance, on adaptation and loss and damage, 
and it encourages countries to increase the participation and leadership of women in climate action and to ensure gender responsive implementation in line with the Gender Action Plan. And it urges countries to actively involve indigenous peoples and local communities in designing and implementing climate action. The Glasgow Climate Pact also delivers for young people. It recognizes the critical role of youth as agents of change. It encourages countries to ensure young people meaningfully participate in decision-making processes, including through national delegations. And it agrees that future COP presidency will facilitate a permanent youth-led climate forum for youth and countries to engage in a dialogue. At COP26, countries also agree to a new 10-year Glasgow work program on action for climate empowerment, providing a framework for action from all countries and stakeholders on climate education, on public perception, as well as promoting youth engagement. And young people were at the heart of the summit at COP26. Young people from the front line address world leaders conveying the scale of the climate crisis and the urgency to act. And we held a dedicated youth and public empowerment day in collaboration with Youngo, where young policy experts shared their priorities with ministers and negotiators. As I say, such commitments did make COP26 historic. Our task now is to turn those commitments into action. And here again, young people will play a vital role. We must make 2022 a year of delivery, a year when promises are honored. So please, push governments to deliver on their commitments. Urge them to increase their climate ambition, to deliver on finance, and to enhance youth participation. By the time we meet in Sharm el-Sheikh for COP27, we must have made real progress. And young people across the world, supported by programs like Climate Connection, can help us to achieve that. So I welcome this event today to share your work, reflect on the achievements, and look at how together we can help to realize the commitments made at COP26. The UK presidency will continue to engage with young people, with civil society and indigenous peoples and others throughout this year. And I look forward to seeing how Climate Connection progresses and, of course, to working with you all. So together, let's make 2022 a year of delivery. Thank you. Indeed, let's make 2022 the year of delivery. I love how he said that, turn those commit commitments into action and delivery. So big thanks to Alex Sharma there for that inspiring message. Now, if we're talking about COP uh, and then thinking ahead to COP27, it's also on the team's mind uh, to tell us more about how this work you know, connects through to COP27. To, uh, to COP27. And to tell us more about that, we are very honored that Ruth Cox is joining us. She is the British Council climate champion and the face of the climate connection in Egypt. So Ruth, I'm super curious to hear from you uh, what your reflections are. Yeah, so Elfia, greetings from Cairo and Egypt. Um, what an introduction, thank you. Yeah, it's brilliant to hear from around the world um, today about all of our work in climate. It's really inspiring um, to get new ideas and to see what people are doing across the boundaries. Um, here in Egypt, we have an ever sharper focus on climate, not only because Egypt's life and livelihood are very vulnerable to climate change through rising sea levels and increasing salinity of the delta, which is affecting farmlands, but through fresh water shortage and increasing desertification, 96% of Egypt's land is, is desert. Um, so there are already challenges. You know, Alexandria will be underwater. The Nile Delta is drying up and there are huge plastic problems. Um, and for this year in particular, is hosting COP27 in Sham, uh, which we are deli delighted by. We had an inkling that that was coming our way during COP26. Um, and so we will be now shining the world's attention on Egypt and the commitments we make here to addressing humanity's greatest challenge. The Egyptian government really are focusing on resilience and adaptation. They are also interested in mitigation, but I think as a less developed nation, um, there are conversations with how developed nations can help the less developed nations sign up to those issues. The uh, focus will be around food shortage and water shortage, particularly transport and um, agriculture. And Egypt is um, looking to be the hub really for Africa in hosting this COP. Um, it's a number one priority for the Egyptian government. It's a number one priority for the UK government. 
Uh, we are working very closely with the embassy as well on the UK-Egyptian Green Partnership, which is the formal handover partnership and MOU that will be uh, signed very soon, looking at um, how we take and support that, that COP presidency from COP26 to COP27 over. Um, the British Council has a unique role to play in that partnership, and we will be continuing our work in the climate connection. Um, and uh, two of the strands there, particularly one around public diplomacy and youth engagement. Um, so working very closely with um, the key players here for us. Um, our work really started last year um, under climate in, in earnest. It's always been a cross-cutting theme for us, and we've always done work on climate through our programs like Newton Masharatha, which are huge science programs that work for a long time in research and climate solutions, desalination, plants being built, and some amazing research. But last year, it really came to the forefront. And, and here in Egypt, we have a microcosm of all of the British Council's work across English arts and education. And that was no exception last year. So we worked with, we reached about 8 million people through our work virtually online and face to face. And all culminated for us when one of our active citizens um, actually addressed the world leaders at the opening ceremony in COP. 26, a young man called Abdul Fattah Nata, who's been working with us on our challenge fund grants here in Egypt in informal settlements in the poorest areas of Cairo. And his message really to the world was to enable circular economy to be mainstreamed into the economics of world leaders' policies. Um, and if we can do it and work with climate issues in communities where they have huge, big issues to address not just climate related, but economically, then, then everybody can do their part. So that was a real pinch, pinch's moment there for someone going from working at community grassroots revel through his opportunities through the British Council and the Climate Connection to being on the world stage with world leaders, with President CC and Joe Biden and everybody looking on. Um, and also we had a visit, of course, from the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall, and they visited our climate programs um, in that community. And that was particularly special for us as well. So we worked across all of our work. We had 30 research links and three mega partnerships with 17 higher education institutions. We got 11 universities to sign up to the Race to Zero when Nigel Topping was in country, who, as you know, is the UK climate and um, high level champion, which was the highest number in Africa. That's a work in progress. We will continue on that. We had over 200 academics and researchers attending our HE roundtables. We had 2,000 runners in a climate awareness race. Um, we worked with 400 people face to face over 10 challenge fund programs across three governments in Egypt. And we had five of the green scholarships that have mentioned from Egypt um, going to the UK to study. So this year we'll really be building on all of that and making sure that legacy is not forgotten and is sustainable. Really in Egypt, we have a huge youth population. So our focus is largely on youth engagement. But what I've been hearing today is actually on some levels troubling, but on some levels reassuring, it's the same comments I hear when I talk to stakeholders in Egypt. This issue of bringing grassroots level to the policymakers, whether that be youth activism, whether that be youth voice, whether that be researchers and what they're doing on the ground in research and how we bring people together to understand what they're doing in research and build that into their policy solutions. Um, so I'm, a lot of what we want to do is really where the British Council can come into that brokering and convening role. Um, the other thing we hear a lot on the ground in Egypt is everybody's doing something in climate at the moment, but it's not necessarily all joined up, which I think resonates with some of the comments I heard from earlier. So that really is where the British Council can add value. We've got um, a large programme in women and girls in Egypt, and we will continue to work with that. And we've also worked with the Al-Azhar um, Institute and universities and schools on climate. And bringing that faith and climate angle is another very interesting area to put a spotlight on. So again, bringing that diversity of voice and inclusive voice to our work. So in English next year, we will build on the um, climate language materials that you heard Colm and Hella talk about earlier. Yeah. We'll roll out to 20,000 teachers, both in Al-Azhar and in, the, um, in our National Ministry of Education programme. We're also looking to introduce that to 1 million climate ambassadors across our higher education network here. We've managed to put that as part of a training programme that's being led um, by universities here in Egypt to train and raise awareness on climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, so much. And yes, it is. I mean, you sold us, I think, <laughs> all, the, all the amazing thing that's happening. I am, like, 
blown away by everything. And it's, as you said, the art right now is in bringing, in bringing it all together, you know, and how we move forward from there. But thank you so much for sharing that with us and like shedding light on what's already happening out there. And I mean, uh, you know, so much of today has been about what has happened in the past and what young people think now. So let's get an idea of what we can expect next from the British Council's team uh, moving out from there. So Mono, maybe if I can turn to you, thinking about, um, you know, the agenda for COP27, what is the plan? Um, well, we've got a lot to do. Uh, we really need to just build on, you know, this momentum um, as we've talked about um, today. And, um, you know, youth engagement, um, as we've just heard from what Ruth was saying, is, is a key priority. And I was fortunate enough as well to meet Abdel Fattah um, Nutter in his work um, doing the grassroots project. So that link to policy. But I think I'll go to, let's go to Alison first, and then <laughs> I've got some announcements on some of our work. Cool, yeah. Thanks very much, Mono. Mono. Um, so yes, as I said before, we'll be increasing our engagement um, from over 100,000 English teachers to 500,000 through some of the initiatives um, at country level, as Ruth mentioned earlier. Um, in our arts work, Rosanna talked about our creative commissions. We'll be launching a new creative commissions call very soon, so watch this space investing in a whole range of different partnerships, both with um, Middle East, North Africa countries and the UK, but also regional initiatives, such as um, an initiative in Korea that I'll be sharing a little bit more about if you're interested. Um, we're also uh, extending our pilot project, uh, the Cultural Protection Fund, is about supporting artists to really protect cultural heritage from the negative impacts of uh, climate change. So that program is extending and will be continuing for the next three years with quite a significant investment over that period. Um, and then I'd like to ask my colleague Madeline, who's our Director of Education Globally, to just talk a little bit about a program that we're continuing in higher education. Thank you, Alison, and thank you to all the colleagues who, who've organised this fantastic and inspiring event today. It's been really energising. So as part of COP26, um, we ran with our friends at the Association of Commonwealth Universities, um, a fairly small scale capacity building research programme, which supported 26 early career resource um, researchers from 16 countries. And the British Council is now really pleased to announce the launch of a new three-year Future Climate Leaders Programme. This new programme will support um, early career researchers in nine Commonwealth countries through research collaboration and professional development and enable them to engage with debate and dialogues at future decision-making platforms such as COP. And this will support the next generation of experts in climate change, adaptation and resilience to face the complex challenges of future years. And I can see that Dr. Joanna Newman is still with us. So I'll turn to her and ask her for her thoughts on this programme and why it's such a good idea. Thank you so much, Madeline. Well, I think if anyone heard from Dr. Mahendra Garucham earlier on, who was our climate funded fellow from uh, University of Mauritius earlier, such an inspiring piece of work that he's doing. And actually, if you think about seeding change in early career researchers is exactly how you create potency across the globe in the programs that fight climate action. And I think that, so I'm very grateful to the British Council for funding this next generation of climate cohort leaders uh, who are outstanding researchers. And it's the connectivity that we can bring to this as two organizations working together that will really help to create the change that we need to do and address it in the urgency that we've heard from all through this morning. So thank you all very much. And I'm very excited about the next, the next phase of our work together. Mano, maybe do you want to add anything? Um, just to add, um, you know, where we started with our Global Youth Letter and 8,000 uh, Rising um, campaign, just building on 
um, those working on addressing those gaps and recommendations in new initiatives and research and through our new um, global program, non-formal education, um, focusing on youth skills, leadership, positive pathways to really try and build capacity and, and address the skills development that's needed to get that action happening and to ensure that grassroots um, voices, as we've heard, really does um, resonate in policy, um, right. you know, policy decision making. Definitely. And I mean, this is an incredible note to sort of wrap the event on, guys. I mean, all these incredible things, the, the scaling up and all the initiatives that we've seen, the great energy coming together. And now I think all that is necessary is connecting it all together and taking it and moving forward from there. So I just want to say thank <laughs> you. Thank you to you all. Thank you, Mano, Alison, Madeline. With that positive outlook for the year ahead, we finished this first ever Climate Connection Global Knowledge Exchange. And I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who contributed and an even bigger thank you to everyone for joining us today and for giving us your time to help exchange knowledge and ideas. And I've got to say a special thank you for you, Mono, for being here with me in the studio and taking us through the incredible program that is Climate Connection. Thank you to the team at the British Council for bringing this event to life. And I mean, obviously, we hope to be able to bring you other chances to exchange more ideas in the future. But until then, it merely leaves me to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and goodbye.